Dear ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Agathon, I'm very pleased to welcome you here to the second day of the Agathon Technology Days 2021, which is all about machines. So here I am standing next to the latest and most groundbreaking grinding machine in Agathon's portfolio, the newly developed Evo Quinto. This machine is indeed so groundbreaking that it deserves its own panel discussion today. But before we get started, I thought I'd take a closer look at this machine and have it explained to me by Martin Niederberger. He's from Technical Sales here at Agathon. Hello, Martin. Hello, Raquel. Could you tell us what the key features of the Evo Quinto are? Sure. So basically, I would say the key feature is, of course, the swiveling range of the A-axis, which is enormous, we can say. And then due to that swiveling range, we were able to grind, for example, profiles of grooving inserts, chip breakers, and yeah, let's say almost any shape is possible to grind on this machine. Interesting, and what shape will you go for today? Yeah, so we decided to grind something special for, for today. So we decided to grind a triangular threading insert. And to make it even more special, we decided to make one of the three corners in the shape of the Matterhorn. Ah, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> and how long will it take for the Evo Quinto to grind this shape? Uh, <clears throat> actually, the whole process takes around four minutes. Yeah. That's actually perfect. So while you're giving us a taste of the Evo Quinto, I'll just quickly go back to the studio to welcome my guests to the panel discussion. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you, Martin. See Thank you later. See you later. Bye. Bye. So while Raquel is heading over to, uh, to the studio, I'm going to start the machine. And we will actually see more about uh, the grinding and the actual insert that we grind on this machine later on. But first, you will see uh, a short clip about the Evo Quinto, and then we'll head back to the studio. Thank you very much for this interesting introduction into the Evo Quinto, Martin. I am now very pleased to welcome you here to our first panel discussion of today, the panel discussion on the new, newly developed Evo Quinto and the latest news in grinding technology. Sorry, I just ran back from the production to here. At the end of this panel, there will be a Q&A, so you are very welcome to post your upcoming questions in the chat. We will be happy to answer them at the end of our panel. And I am now very happy to welcome here Dr. Stefan Scholze, CTO and also co-owner of the company since 2015, as well as Daniel Felber, he's CSO here at Agathon, and Simon Girardin, he's Vice Director Sales Machine here at Agathon. A warm welcome to you all. Welcome. Hello, Rob. Hi. Welcome to. And uh, remotely connected, of course, also is Professor Barman Asar Husheng, head of the Institute of Precision Machining at the Tutlingen Innovation and Research Center from the University, Furtwangen University in Germany. A warm welcome to you as well, Professor. Stefan, we just had the pleasure of seeing the newly developed Evo Quinto. When did you start developing the Evo Quinto and why? Well, the idea to enhance the Agathon kinematics uh, also to be able to grind <coughs> on the chip breaker side of the insert was around for some time. 
Uh, we then saw that on the market, uh, the availability of production means was getting worse. And so this was really the moment where we said, OK, now we really have to take concrete action. So about uh, 2019, all the key elements of the solution were in place. And we started this project according to our Agaton innovation uh, process. So uh, the Quinto machine really is the first of uh, the Agaton machines, which is able to grind the circumference, um, the profile, and also the chip breaker in just uh, one clamping. So this makes the machine very flexible. But uh, at the same time, we also put a very high priority uh, on the ability to be very productive. Mm. So. This is what we put from the development side inside. Now, maybe uh, just looking into the direction of uh, the market. Uh, Simon, what do you experience from the side of our customers? Well, if we look at the market, I think there is definitely a need for a machine in, in this area. When we look how a thread insert, for example, is uh, ground today, we see that there is different possibilities to grind such an insert. As you already mentioned, there is the circumference that is made, for example, by a Leo, our smallest machine. Or then you have the, the profile of the, of the thread insert that has to be ground on a profile machine. With the Evo, as already mentioned many times, it is possible to grind this insert in one clamping. Um, and I think just looking at that already, it's, it's, it's a huge benefit for our customers to combine these processes uh, save time and have a very accurate uh, insert in the end. So I can imagine that there uh, there is a lot of need for a machine <laughs> in this area. Thank you. Stefan, what were your first steps and successes in the development of the Evo Quinto? Uh, so the first uh, step, the first task we had to solve really was uh, the, the clamping of the workpiece. So it must be possible to um, orient the workpiece in a tangential way to the grinding wheel. Um, this was done uh, by uh, 3D modeling of the uh, entire workpiece spindle head. So we started with a simple one, when in each iteration we added a lot of details. So by now the workpiece spindle head consists of about 4,000 4, parts. Mm -hmm. So it's quite complex. It also shows a very high function integration. So for example, there are meters of uh, hydraulic tubing inside uh, the spindle head. Mm -hmm. um, so our uh, development process is agile and uh, we realized a lot of early uh, functional prototypes to support this process. Because our goal was really to come up with a first complete prototype which is already uh, so mature that it's possible to produce really good inserts. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm stating that here, but um, maybe Daniel, you can comment on it because you were uh, really together with the customer running the first experiments here. What's your experience? Yeah, the first moment was actually a fantastic experience. Um, it was the time when we uh, placed the prototype of the workpiece spindle head inside the Evo model, inside the Evo platform, pressed the button and the machine was running as expected. The movements were like we uh, wanted the movements to be. Of course, this was only possible due to two reasons. On one hand side, we had the Evo platform that is also available in the very well and very strong brand of the Evo Quint, uh, of the Evo Combi and the Evo Penta and known in the market where we already could gain a lot of experience. On the other hand side, there was the Agathon syntax that didn't have to go through a change process. We could actually use the Agathon syntax, program the part and the machine just did the movement that we wanted and we could grind. And this was a really fantastic moment. Mm -hmm. Were there any challenges during the development process, Simon? Yes, of course, there's, there are always challenges. And uh, <laughs> so also in this project, of course, um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges we had were, was our uh, collision prevention. What do you mean by that? The collision prevention is a automatic collision prevention. So um, <laughs> it's best to, uh, to give you a short example quickly. 
On our EVO platform, it's possible to grind on both sides of the grinding wheel. So if you have a typical inset where you need this function, you have uh, a two-side chamfer. So you grind the first chamfer on the left side, and then you go on the right side to grind the second chamfer. So what you have to do now is basically only say to the machine that you want to grind the second chamfer on the, on the right side. The rest, the whole movement of the, of the insert to this right side is done by the machine automatically, of course, and without any collisions. And I think that, is the, that was the, the, key, the key important part. So you don't have any collisions when you work with our machines. So this means that at Akaton you don't program the moven, movements, but the workpiece. Uh, how easy is the programming? Uh, the programming is actually as easy as you could think about. Um, the HMI, the human machine interface, and the programming is on all platforms exactly the same. This means, uh, is it a Leo, is it a DOM, or is it an Evo generation? All work with the same syntax, uh, which is uniform for all platforms. And this makes it very comfortable for the operator to enter into the programming, because there is no difference uh, inside there. Um, as mentioned before, the, the nice thing was that this also counted for the Quinto, so we didn't have to implement new syntaxes, develop new syntaxes. We could just go inside and uh, yeah, program the part and make fantastic parts. Well, everything we heard of now is already very advanced technology, but uh, let's have a brief look into the future. What else could be possible, Stefan? Yeah, looking into the future, okay, we see we will get a lot of flexibility, which is very important. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand side, uh, one important uh, trajectory is the autonomy and support systems of the machine. So mm -hmm. when we think about uh, setting up the grinding process, this really needs a lot of expertise. And an expert system can really be very helpful in that direction. And I think we will hear an example from a different domain in grinding right now. Yes, exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, expert systems are already in use in grinding today. And we would be interested in, in to know whether such systems could also be uh, interesting for the Agaton machineries. Therefore, we have invited Professor Azar Husheng. He's the head of the Institute of Precision Machining at the Tutlingen Innovation and Research Center of Furtwangen University in Germany. And he agreed to give us a short lecture on this topic. Um, dear Professor, having said that, I'm very pleased to hand over to you. Thank you very much, dear Raquel. Thank you for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my presentation regarding the expert system in the field of grinding. We do believe that with, with this type of expert system, we can build a new future for the grinding process. Today, I want to present you the expert system developed at our institute, but before that we present it live, I mean, going to the website and showing show you the features that are included in this expert system. I want to speak for a few minutes regarding the motivation behind these kind of expert systems and why do we need these type of expert systems in the grinding process. So if we consider the grinding process in detail, we see that the process is relatively complex. We have several input parameters. These input parameters influence the workpiece quality as well as the process time and the costs that are involved with the process. So we need a holistic view to understand the interchangeability of these input parameters towards the output parameters. And the expert should understand also the process characteristics in detail which is itself a really difficult task. To that come also other factors. When we consider the grinding tools, then we see really fast that the grinding tools have completely different dimensions and also the form and geometry of the grinding tools are all the times matched to the geometry of the workpiece. But the workpiece itself, has different type of materials and hardnesses and the geometry can be really complicated. In this case, you need 5x simultan machining. And another factor is the workpiece dimension. In the field of grinding, we have actually work pieces which are huge, several meters in diameter and also several meters long. 
but at the same time also micro work pieces that are drawn, like for example micro tools. But even if we consider one production line, the possibility that we face new products in the common daily basis is really high. And also the fact that all the times new materials are developed and these materials are challenging in the many ways in the field of grinding is also there. Another aspect that is actually following us in the field of grinding technology in the last few years, even decades, is the high accuracies and tolerance tolerances that are recommended for the ground work pieces. Another factor is the surface quality. We want to achieve all the times better surface qualities, but the customers expect that the parts become cheaper. So we need to produce much more complex work pieces with much higher demands in the quality, but we should assure that the process costs are low as possible. And even if we control a process really good and we have a really good repeatability, there is a still a big chance that now and then we face several grinding errors. So we should be able to find out the reasons behind these errors and solve them as soon as possible because we don't want to experience the process stop and the production is stop because the cost will be huge. So it's really hard to find a, an expert or even few experts together who can cover all these aspects that we mentioned in the last two slides. But even if we have some experts at the company, which are really experienced in the field of grinding, they should be able to decide in rather short time regarding the suitable grinding tools, specification, dressing tools, grinding and dressing parameters to actually to use the parts in a way that is acceptable for the customers. Another factor for the company who is producing this part is the process efficiency. We should be sure the process that is actually running at our, in, uh, our, in our, our production is efficient enough because we are facing uh, actual competitions from all over the world. And it's really important to be sure that the process efficiency at our plants are high enough in order to still be competitive. And we should be in the situation to solve the errors in a really short time. So the troubleshooting and the knowledge regarding the troubleshooting is also very important. Another factor that we are facing all over the world. So I visited several countries, many companies, and I see all the times the same trends is the fact that the few experts that are in the companies are actually high skill workers with lots of experiences, but they won't be there for the next 20, 30 years. So the grinding process is complex. It takes really long time to become an expert. And when you are really at this time that you can help the company, probably in a few years, then you go to retirement and then there will be a vacuum on the company regarding the grinding processes in the company. So it's really important for the uh, single companies to assure that the knowledge which is generated inside the company is stored and also this knowledge is distributed between all operators or the people which are defined by the company this way they can be sure that they can produce with the same quality in future as well another challenging aspect is to get really good information information that are reliable regarding the new technological aspects. So if a really great grinding tool is developed, if a really great machine like the machine that we are hearing today from Agaton is developed that can actually grind work pieces in completely other ways that till now uh, was not possible, then we want to be the first persons who get this information because these informations can actually help us to produce even more complex parts in shorter time and more efficient. So these are the reasons that even experts need help, need platforms that can actually help them to find the suitable process parameters in really short time, suitable grinding tool, dressing tools, and also get enough information regarding the actually new technologies and 
ensure the storage of the knowledge. So it's a the decision of the company. If they want to save all the data, that's also the possibility with these experiences. So I spoke about the motivation and I think it would be good to see how this expert system looks in the reality. So we have a web-based expert system that we developed here. You see the website. So we have at the moment three different modules. In the first module, you can choose a grinding wheel which is adapted to your requirements. So you need to tell the system what you are looking for, what type of the process, what is the work piece that you want to buy, what is the requirement of the surface quality, even the profile accuracy, and then a suitable grinding wheel, either conventional or super abrasive, will be actually suggested to you. And then according to this suggestion, you can contact your wheel manufacturers and discuss with them regarding the new grinding tools that you require for the coming processes. And that's a really important step because this way you can be sure that you have the good wheel at the time that you need and you don't want to have trial and errors, test the first wheel, send it back and then try the second wheel. Another aspect is dressing. We say in German that if you don't know how to dress the wheel, you shouldn't start the grinding process at the first step. So we try to support also the companies with their uh, actually dressing tools, but which are suitable for the grinding wheels and also dressing parameters. And at the moment, the last module is the grinding module, the most important module here. When you enter this module, we have at the moment four different grinding processes from cylinder car grinding, external cylinder car grinding towards the surface grinding and uh, centerless grinding. Right now, today, I cannot show you all the modules, so I concentrate um, to, towards the cylinder car grinding and I show you, for example, longitudinal cylinder car grinding. If you go under the longitudinal cylinder car grinding, you see that you have different options. You can get actually uh, some suggestions regarding really optimized grinding processes, or you can give the process parameters that you are using or you think that are good, and then the process parameters that you suggested will be also evaluated by our system, and we have troubleshooting. Let's start the suggestions of the parameters. So here you should choose the workpiece material. At the moment, we have two types of materials, a steel and a stainless steel. In the coming weeks, we will add other materials like ceramics, like cemented carbides, like titanium, and then the material groups will be updated. So I choose steel and hardened steel, for example. You can choose the grinding wheel that you're using, abrasives in this field, because the grinding wheel will be chosen in other module. But here you have the possibility to choose whether you're using, for example, corundum or CBN or diamond and so on. So let's choose CBN for hardened steel is always a good choice. And then you can decide whether you want to do roughing, semi-finishing, finishing, or even polishing, as I say, um, as a pr process that you achieve the best surface quality. Let's start with roughing. When you do roughing, you want to have really high material removal rates. You want to achieve actually most of the stock removal in the shortest time. And here at the next step, you need to give some information regarding grinding wheel diameters. Just consider a diameter of 450 millimeter, which is a common standard for CBN grinding wheels. The width of the wheel, 30 millimeters, you can write whatever you want here, which is your standard. Then you should decide about the grid size, either a mesh or a micrometer. FEPA standards, for example, I can put under seven micrometers. And you see within less than one second, then you can see what is the actually um, adequate number in mesh. So 107 micrometers is almost 150 mesh. And the next step is, decision about the cutting speed, we actually suggest to use the highest cutting speed possible in each process. Just see 
60 meters per second. And you see here that the system says, if you use CBN grinding wheels, please choose cutting speed more than 35 per meter per second. It would be great. You can use the full potential of CBN at uh, cutting speeds higher than 60 meters per second. And that's what we chose. And then the workpiece diameter, you can put any workpiece diameter, just let us start with 30 millimeters, yeah? And that's it. With one enter, you get all required parameters here. You see the cutting speed ratio. So for roughing, you can choose whatever between 40 and 60. So the system offers 50 here. Then the overlap ratio by grinding, this overlap ratio actually influences the axial field speed. There are lots of explanation regarding these parameters. And when you are even not an expert in the field of grinding, using this information, you get lots of new ideas regarding how you can optimize the process. The depth of cut is given here and the rotation speed of the workpiece and the axial feed speed. And you see here with CBN, we can achieve really high material removal rates. We can also realize really high axial feed speeds. Just look at this. We have 13.5 cubic millimeter per millimeter per second. Uh, specific material removal rates, the process actually is roughing. And here I change, for example, the process from roughing to finishing, yeah? And then these process parameters changes. You see the depth of cut is reduced significantly. The speed ratio is completely changed. The axial uh, feed speed is completely changed. So the system consider all parameters at the same time. It offers a really great holistic view and it can be used also for the teaching aspects. And now I want also to show you the Troubleshooting parts. So if we go back to cylindrical grinding, for example, axial grinding, you can go to the troubleshooting. You can decide between troubleshootings considering the optical, uh, actually mistakes or uh, problems in the grinding. And here you have lots of images. So you can see thermal damages. You can see, for example, fish marks or fish skins on the surface of the workpiece, chatter, feed marks, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And then if you, for example, cl click on it, you see, OK, how does it look like? What are the reasons behind it? How can you solve these problems as well? And these are all integrated at the moment in this expert system. Currently, more than 15 companies are using this. We are actually in a test phase, and uh, we hope that we can offer this system in the uh, near future to lots of companies. And we are looking forward to work closely also with companies like Agaton that are actually producing grinding machines to integrate this kind of expert system also in grinding machines. So I'm going back to my presentation to have a conclusion. You saw that with this expert system, you have the possibility to select the grinding wheels, the dressers, the dressing and grinding parameters, and also get enough information regarding troubleshooting. Uh, you saw that it's really fast and you get all the parameters at a glance. Additionally, you can be sure if you want, so it's your decision regarding the data safety. If you allow us, we can save these data for you. We can do also anonymization and give you feedback what kind of parameters are offered to your colleagues, which kind of parameters or data are used to actually teach our expert system. And in future, we want to have new modules where we can also inform the customers regarding the new technologies out there. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that you enjoy these new possibilities in the grinding process. And I'm sure that the future of the grinding process would be completely different than the current situation. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you very much, Professor Azar Hussein, for this highly informative and interesting guest lecture which you gave us here at the Agathon Technology Days 2021. Now I would like to ask uh, Stefan and Daniel, we just heard this uh, guest lecture from Professor Baman Azar Hussein. What are your comments on that or do you have any questions? Yeah, but first of all, uh, I want to thank you very much, Baman for this very interesting talk and this very interesting presentation of uh, a system, I think, uh, which we will uh, use in the future. We already, uh, Agathon is uh, also one of the companies who is testing the system inside our own production. Um, I have one question. Uh, do you have experiences how the performance of the system compares to the uh, to the to uh, an experienced operator. Yeah, really great question. Thank you, Stefan. Also, thank you for having me today. Um, we tested it uh, prior to launching the first phase. So we did a um, survey. We defined a process and asked ten different, actually, really high skill operators. So. Uh, the persons who are doing the grinding process on a daily basis regarding a cylindrical workpiece. We gave the information regarding the workpiece geometry, the hardness, and also the required uh, dimension accuracy and surface quality. And they had the task to offer us different grinding parameters and also the suitable grinding and dressing tools that they think could actually be useful for this process. And it was really interesting that our expert system was among the best actually results that we got. So the experience of these experts together were over 300 years. So we have experts more than 65 years old, grinding last 40 years. And when we collected the whole experience, it was a huge amount of experience. And our expert system was actually the top two of these test and it was a great result for us and there would be a publication in this field as well congratulations now these are really uh, outstanding results that's great mm -hmm. any other mm. remarks from daniel or yeah thank you very much um, also, it was very interesting to see uh, what is possible today. And of course, my question coming from the market would be uh, if such a system could yeah, take the data from a program and uh, make the calculations and play the, the values back to the program, would this be a model? Yeah, that could be also a model. We are, we are actually working on uh, different scenarios at the moment. But uh, the problem is that our institute is relatively small. I should be open regarding that. And we are hoping to collaborate with really big players like Agaton and with this collaboration, getting new ideas and try to find out the solutions <clears throat> for these kind of questions. So that would be also an option. What we are also thinking is that actually having this system installed on grinding machines and give, for example, pushback information to the uh, operators regarding, for example, possibilities that they have to optimize the process itself. So we can monitor the parameters that are, they are using and get some results from the machine towards itself. So, for example, what is the uh, power consumptions of the spindle or how are the different axes loaded? and get some information and give some feedbacks whether you have the possibility to achieve even higher material removal rates. Because the situation in each grinding machine is different, depending on the, the actually fixturing that you use, the workpiece quality and the material removal rates. And it would be great in future if we can have expert systems that are matched to different scenarios. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Azar Hussein, for being here today and for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Wish you, you all the best. Thank you. For you too. Thank for you. you too.
Ladies and gentlemen, after all this interesting input from Professor Barman and Asarusheng, we would now like to take this opportunity to ask you if you think that such expert systems would be interested, interesting on Agaton machineries. You can now see a QR code and a link. Please enter your answers right now because we are already very curious to know what you think on this subject. And we will discuss this at the end of the, pa of the panel again. So please enter your your answers right now. Thank you very much. After all this, I would also like to quickly switch back to the Evo Quinto. Simon is now also with, with Martin on the production. And uh, Simon and Martin, what can you tell us more about the Evo Quinto? Hello, Raquel. Hello, dear viewers. Hi, Martin. Hello. We are back here in front of the Evo Quinto. Martin, you have stopped the process in the middle of the program mm -hmm. so that we can have a look inside. Is exactly. it safe to open the door? Yeah, you might open the door. Martin, is it, can you tell us a little bit more on, on the position the machine is in right now? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, basically, right now the machine is at its uh, tangential position. That means that our clamping tools, so driving arbor and clamping arbor, are in a tang tangential direction uh, compared to the outer diameter, so the periphery of the grinding wheel. Yeah. In this position, we are able to grind, for example, chip breakers, as we said, or another example would be the profile that we grind here. Yeah, but let's have a look on how the machine actually moves, right? So let me just start, start the machine, go back to the program. Yeah, uh, Simon, yesterday you told us something about that there are similarities between uh, grinding indexable inserts and climbing the summit of the Matterhorn. Do you see more similarities than just the roots that you talked about yesterday? Yeah, Martin, I think there is one more similarity that we can, we can mention here uh, in comparison with the Evo Quinto and the Matterhorn. And it's mainly in the area of the technological process. So looking back at 1865, when Edward Wimper climbed the Matterhorn for the first time, on the 4th, uh, 14th of July, he was, in, he was in a group of six other people that together they reached the, the summit of, of the Matterhorn. I think it's safe to say that a single person alone wouldn't have reached the top at this time of, of, uh, of time. So 150 years later, one single person, Donny Arnold, climbs the Matterhorn in one hour and 46 minutes. This shows really impressively what over time technological process and state of mind is, is, uh, is possible. If you have seen the north face of the Matterhorn, the route Donny Arnold took, you know that it's not a chilling Sunday hike with your family. So what does this mean if we compare it to our Evo Quinto. When we go back in time and we grind this insert that we are grinding here today, it is also, <coughs> we also know that it took more than one machine to grind, this, to grind this insert. So today, here, it is possible to grind such an insert with one machine in one clamping and gain a very high accuracy and a very nice <coughs> and a very high flexibility. But I think it's best if you, Martin, show us a little bit or can explain a little bit on, on the processes that we are able to combine here on one machine. Yeah, so basically the processes that we combine here on this machine and this specific application are, first of all, the periphery grinding of that specific insert. Uh, we do the threading profile and also the chip breaker, and that's all in one clamping, actually. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, I would say let's have a look on an insert. So I'll just quickly oh, yes. take them out. So let me just. So let's have a look under the microscope. Just quickly clean it a little bit. And what we see here is now the typical fretting insert. Uh, just once more, what we did is we ground the periphery here, all around the triangle. We did the profile, the typical fretting profile that we did uh, in a tangential position I just showed yeah. you before. We also did that top radius here mm -hmm. at the tip. And we also did actually the chip breaker here in this area. So having a look on the next corner looks the same. Turning it once more, we have here something special. <laughs> do you recognize this shape, Simon? I think I do, yes. Yeah. So actually, uh, just to show what we're actually able to, to grind on this machine, we ground the profile of the Matterhorn, our motto today, on this insert. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. You're I think we look forward welcome. to all the threads in the Matterhorn shape, in screws and bits <laughs> in the future. Exactly. Yeah. I would like to briefly summarize what we have seen and heard and talked about the Evo Quinto today. Um, I think we can say that we have set a new possibility, a new route on uh, how to grind and produce complex inserts in uh, these typical shapes, for example, as this insert we have right here. And um, I think we are able to close a, a gap that is between the flexibility and the productivity of, uh, of such machines. Now I hope that you have many questions in regards of possi possible uh, products uh, for this machine and please feel free to contact us on our chat function or also on our parallel sessions and we definitely look forward to your challenges. Now I will hand back to you Raquel and I wish you all continuous interesting Agaton Technology Days 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon and Martin, for these further insights into the Evo Quinto. Thank you very much for this. Daniel, now I'm very curious to know what the timetable for the market launch look like. Yeah, uh, currently we are doing internal tests and we will continue them to learn about the behavior of this um, new machine. Um, furthermore, we have um, a field customer that is actually helping us to understand in a, in, a, in a live production how the machine is working and to learn. There, very important is the triangle between customer, application and um, uh, technology department, the technology department, to, to move forward very fast. This means that the first machines are available in the market from the beginning of 2022. That's when we will start our global rollout. Thank you very much. And before concluding this panel, I would also like to quickly come back to the survey on the expert systems. We can now see the result. Stefan and Daniel, can you comment on that? I yeah, think the so audience cannot see the results. Yeah, Sorry, uh, so yeah. maybe I just uh, name the, uh, uh, the dimensions. So where is mm -hmm. the majority which is stating, yeah, absolutely yes. And uh, uh, also in the second uh, place, it's mostly yes. Mm -hmm. So if we put the, the positive answers together, I think that's really a, a clear trend, a clear indication um, that uh, there's interest to pursue this this goal and uh, people are obviously curious to see what is possible with this type of system. So that's encouraging for us. It's mm -hmm. good to hear. We um, and for sure, um, I think uh, we, we will uh, look into this direction. Daniel, what do you think? Yeah, the market has spoken mm -hmm. and the trend is absolutely 
um, yeah, totally different than this morning, but um, um, for a yes too. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we really have to discuss this and see what is possible on an Agaton platform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this on the expert system. Now let's come back quickly also to the Evo Quinto. When will clients be able to carry out grinding trials at your premises? Currently we're in the situation that we can do uh, time studies uh, with our customers. So those customers who already, already know our control system, they know if you have programmed the part, then you get a very nice simulation showing you the condition of the machine. On the other hand side, you also see the time, how short it is to produce that part that you have programmed. And uh, our application is already very glad to accept your drawings to make a time study for you. So you can think about uh, rentability. Um, after the summer vacation, we will um, start to book time slots for um, real tries together with your parts, with your materials, um, sometimes also with your grinding wheels. So please send us your drawings and we will be happy to carry out a test for you. Thank you. And can clients also use the same tools as for other uh, Agaton machines? Yeah. Yeah, so mostly yes, uh, that's uh, one uh, one of the advantages with Agaton. So we, we have, first of all, we offer different tooling systems. Mm -hmm. So we have the a uh, HSK system, we have B3 clamping, we have B1 clamping. So these are all the same tools and they are compatible also with Evo Quinto. And in addition, we also have uh, a new clamping anvils, uh, which is also for the B1 clamping which are uh, necessary to uh, also machine the workpiece in the tangential position. Mm -hmm. So mostly, yes. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> and what about the programs? Can clients also use the same grinding programs as for the other machines with the Evo Queen? Yes, mm -hmm. definitely, yes. Uh, Daniel also mentioned it before. Yeah, this is also another strong point. We developed this uh, domain-specific uh, programming language over the years. We started in 1980 to develop this and uh, continuously added, uh, but the, the basic structure is, is the same. It's workpiece oriented and it also uh, the same concepts carry over to the Quinto. So there was no need to add additional um, structures into the syntax. And all our customers who already know the programming language just can com uh, also um, program more uh, complex work pieces which are now possible on the Quinto. Yeah, thank you very much, Stefan, and also for the others for this valuable insights into the Evo Quinto and the outlooks into the future. Thank you again, Stefan, Simon, Daniel, and also Martin. Thank you for being here. Dear ladies and gentlemen, after all this information, we will now like to take this opportunity to ask you again. What possibilities do you dream of? What would you wish Agaton to realize for you if anything was possible? There are no limits to your ideas. Please write us your wishes in the chat because we are already very curious to find out what your wishes are. And I would also like to take this opportunity to remind you of the option of booking an individual parallel session with our consultants at any time today. To book such a session, simply scroll down this event page and select the desired consultant. Please do not hesitate to take advantage of this offer because we are at your disposal and are already very much looking forward to a personal exchange with you. And before we continue with our next informative panel discussion on the cutting edge topic of subscription and digitalization, you'll now have the opportunity to win a virtual reality full kit from HTC Vive Pro worth 1,200 euros in our competition. All you have to do to win is to prove your knowledge in machinery and subscription and answer four questions. You will now see a QR code displayed, which you can scan to as access the competition page, or you can also enter the displayed link into your browser in order to access the competition pa play page. For the draw, please register with your first and last name. Your answers will be evaluated until the end of the next panel discussion, and the name of the winner will be announced right after the panel discussion. 
We keep our fingers crossed for you and see you again in five minutes for the panel discussion on subscription and digitalization.
Welcome back to the second part of today's event, the panel discussion on subscription and digitalization. At the end of this panel discussion, there will be a Q&A, so you are very welcome to post your upcoming questions in the chat. We will have our experts here answer them for you at the end of our panel. Now, I I'm very pleased to welcome Christoph Stürchler. He's the head of subscription here at Agathon, as well as Thomas Hess, he's head of after sales at Agathon, and Oliver Demus from Heidelberger Druckmaschinen. He's the head of, of uh, Subscription Sales and Customer Success Management at Heidelberger Druckmaschinen. He's remotely connected. Hello to you as well. And Hello. as well, our two doctoral students from the University of St. Gallen, Jonathan Rösler and Christoph Tienken. A warm welcome to you all. Christoph, let's start with you. Um, Heidelberger Druckmaschinen, Netflix or Hilti are leading the way. Subscription models are on the road to success. What's Agathon's position on this matter? Yeah, I think we are on the right path. About one and a half years ago, we at Agathon decided to have a look closer to subscription as a business model. We did a lot of research in the meantime, communicated with companies in related industries and involved customers. We realized that the introduction of such a business model in um, our traditional industry is equivalent to a small revolution. But we've also learned that it has a lot of potential for you as customer and for us as well. You, for example, you gain flexibility and planability. With future services like um, pay-per-use, you can increase your networking capital by shifting investment costs towards operation costs. We at our side, we gain um, long-term customer loyalty and of course we can learn from you. Internally, we see the possibility to take advantage of synergies with our existing offerings from the after-sales department. Speaking of after sales, Thomas mm -hmm. Hess, um, Agathon is currently offers already several different products in the 360 care world. Is our subscri subscription models also planned or available in the 360 care world already? Yeah. Um, let us first look back a little bit. Um, we decided three years ago to review our existing services, our existing customer services with the goal to implement more value for the customers into this. What finally ends up in the Care 360 world with the different services what we have there. When Christoph started with his, whole pro uh, with his project about the subscription, we have figured out that with the Care 360 world and the sub subscription, we have the possibility for making more value again for the customers and that's now where we will go into the future to give this advantage to the customers as well. So finally, to your initial question, yes, we will have also services from the Care 360, what we can, per, uh, what we can sell then um, as a subscription product. Thank you very much, Christoph and Thomas, for this introduction. Now, ladies and gentlemen, one of the first companies who successfully implemented such subscription models in the machinery sector is Heidelberger Druckmaschinen AG and Oliver Demus, head of, subs uh, head of subscription sales and customer success management at Heidelberger, will now tell us how they have managed to successfully transform themselves. And Oliver, would say, having said that, I'm very happy to hand over to you to your guest lecture. Thank you, Raquel. Um, hello, everybody, and greetings to, to Switzerland and the rest of the world. Um, thank you for letting me show you the subscription model at Heidelberg. And well, let's go through it. A few words about myself. Um, I grew up in the printing industry and then since 20 years working with Heidelberg in various positions from service consulting and now since almost five years with a subscription model. Um, a few facts about Heidelberg. 
Um, we are about 170 years old. Uh, we have globally 10,500 employees. Uh, group revenue from the fiscal year 2021 of 1.9 billion, 250 locations in 170 countries, and about 85% uh, of, oh, 85%, excuse me, is for export. Um, what do we have on products? For those who don't know us, uh, mainly our main product is a printing press. And we also have everything which is following in that regard for folding, et cetera, basically to have a finished product coming out of a print shop. Also, we have software which is managing everything from order intake estimate through to the pre-press workflow up to the, have a printing plate and then going to the printing press with all the informations all the way at the end to the invoice and delivery note. We provide a 24 seven service worldwide with the headquarters here in Germany, but also service employees in all of our locations around the world. And we are in the consumables business and consumables is everything you need to print except paper. So printing plates, ink, chemistry, etc. So why subscription at Heidelberg? What was the trigger for us to do it? And I want to show you the situation at Heidelberg and at our customers. And there, out of those things we generated, or those were the triggers for the business model subscription at Heidelberg. So the situation at Heidelberg, everybody believes that the Printing is going away. Here you see the charts of the print production volume of a global basis, where you can see it's basically flat. It's not really growing, but it's also not really declining. The areas of the blue and yellow, these are the markets we provide equipment for in the printing industry. And what you can see here between 2007 and 2009, there was a little dip that was a crisis there. And then of course, um, capital equipment sales is not the highest at those points. So what did we want to achieve? We wanted to grow and we wanted to eliminate dips. In the growing regard, if you look at sheet fed offset presses, that is what we are um, building. There were 2.4, that's a 2.4 billion market on an annual basis. And we have already a market share for larger than 40%. And the consumables business, where it is an $8 billion market, or Euro market, sorry. And we have only 5%, but we are one of the biggest suppliers in consumables worldwide. So there's many, many, many small suppliers, and this is the area we, we, where we wanted to grow as well. So to summarize, um, we wanted to grow in the businesses of consumables and service, and we wanted to stabilize our business and also reducing dips to, during pricing situations. What was the situation at our customers? If you look at this chart, you see the consumables, basically paper and ink prices going up over time and staying stable up and slightly growing as well. But the price for a printed product basically stayed stable. So it was either for our customers a reduction in profit or they had to become more efficient to keep the same profit margins. By analyzing our customers where they can improve, we found that 55% of the time is already spent before the job really starts getting into production. So time spent with estimating job cost and pre-press, et cetera, et cetera, up to it comes to really where somebody touches the job. So there was a huge potential. And then this was kind of shocking news to us on the left side, you see the average impression amount customers do in the US with our presses, and that is about 30 million. On the right hand side, you see best in class, and they produce about 90 million. So that's about triple what the average does. So there's a huge gap and huge potential for customers to perform better and reduce cost. We have plotted all the customers uh, with their performance in an OEE chart, OEE, overall equipment effectiveness. This shows you how well you utilize the equipment. 
and that independency to the average run length, which is a high influence factor in the printing industry. So these are the customers today with the average, and we believe with our extra services, we can move the performance up to the circuit area here to basically reduce cost of production and increase the customer's profit. So to summarize it quickly again, um, Heidelberg wanted to grow the business and also um, want to re eliminate dips in crisis and stabilize the business. On the customer side, uh, we wanted to help the customers to utilize maximum potential and with that reducing cost and with that increasing profit. That was the situation we had. And then we thought what could we provide and that was our subscription model in one part which comes to mind and therefore I like this picture here. The subscription model, how we call it at Heidelberg is not just a contract we are going to selling, sell to customers. It's a partnership, it's, it's a team where you need to work together. Otherwise it doesn't work either for us or for the customer. And very important, it's here on the lower right-hand side, we have the same goal. Um, the more the customer prints, the more money he makes and more profit, but also we participate on that since he would buy from us the presses, the consumables and the service. Let me explain how, how it cost justified it and how it worked. If you look at a print job today, um, there is a portion of the equipment in there, there's service cost in, and there's about a third of consumables speaking, um, ink, plates, etc. And the rest up to the selling price is then the profit margin. So how could we as Heidelberg help the customers to increase profit? So we give them a performance or an output promise. How do we do that? We evaluate the customers and see where their weaknesses are and what they would need to be more profitable. And then when we offer the subscription model, it includes uh, consulting to become more efficient with processes. It includes training, of course, the service of the equipment, the consumables, the equipment itself, and our software. So, and the, the new part here is because you could buy that also before, you pay it combined in a cost per sheet, cost per printed sheet of paper. So that was new. So there's no discussion anymore. Do I need extra training? Do I need consulting? It's you pay per sheet and we do everything it takes to, to get you the biggest output you can get on that piece of equipment. How does it look afterwards? Um, because we can increase the performance of the equipment. So the cost per printed sheet goes basically down and that increases the profit in the end per printed job. And the customer doesn't have discussions anymore with multiple vendors on, on for example, consumables or trading or service and the equipment. It's a blended price out of everything. And for selling purpose, I always told the customer, yes, you don't see the single prices anymore, but if I can give you a better price per printed sheet as of what you have now, that should be working for you. What are the benefits which come with a subscription model based contract? Because most of the things you were able to purchase also prior with Heidelberg. Um, so one of the major benefits is you have an assigned customer success manager who takes care of all the customer needs. He's yeah, basically, as the word says, uh, responsible for the customer's success. And they are in very close contact on not always daily basis, but on a short period basis. We implemented the vendor managed inventory to eliminate processes for material ordering at the customer site. We have uh, devices where the customer scans it and takes it out of inventory so we know what he has, but also the press can already report back material which was utilized. So we know it from the press basically what needs to be shipped back to the customer. 
Um, we have monthly calls with the customers and the customer success managers and everybody else who needs to be involved from the Heidelberg side. And very important on the customer side, um, there's everybody involved from the press, from the printing press, all the way to upper management. So everybody's on the same page. Uh, there's no hiding the facts and so on. You'd, and in those calls, you talk about the performance of the equipment, uh, customer satisfaction with the contract and the equipment. We, you talk about service items to, to verify that the press is in a good shape. Sometimes customers know, oh, something is broken at the press, but I can still produce. And they fail to report it to Heidelberg or we don't see it in that regard. So this call is really made to at least once a month, there's a contact between all the parties to clarify all open issues and discuss performance of the press. And in this call, there's also set the target for the next month. Is there any support needed for training, consulting or anything else on the equipment side? And then we execute it the next month. Predictive monitoring to basically eliminate unplanned downtime. We have tons of sensors in the press which report um, on a daily basis issues which could occur on the press and will show us, well, device ABC might fail within the next two weeks. So then we can turn it from unplanned to planned downtime and that reduces time in the downtime. So in the end, the customer has more time for production. We established an artificial intelligence because we can't have always a consultant at, at the customer site. So the artificial intelligence observes the press and the operation. And if it sees that there is something going wrong or time is wasted, it reports back and says, listen, I found something going on and says, provides to the operator information of what he could do better to eliminate the problem. On the same end side, the management of the shop gets, gets the same information, but not with what to do to make it better. The, the management gets the information. There's an issue and it costs you so much time or so much material, make sure it's getting fixed. So on both levels, everybody is informed to, um, to, to really know what's going on at the press and also what the cost is not to fix those issues. Um, next part is the Heidelberg Assistant, which is our online portal from our customers to the Heidelberg world. Um, here on this platform, you can see statistics or KPIs of your press. You can see the press performance. You see how much waste you generate for setups and so on. Um, you can also do online training. The artificial intelligence is also working through that portal. And if you need to order material, which is not managed through the vendor managed inventory, you can order that through this portal as well. And there's more and more functions coming to it. And very nice one is you can see all the service calls either closed or open. If they are open, you can see what is the next step. When is the technician scheduled and what needs to be done? Um, very important too is with the Heidelberg um, subscription model, you get extra instructor support for, I call it the extra handholding. Um, one of my bosses always compared the printing press with a Formula One car. And he said, well, there's a lot of customers that are buying this Formula One car and they expect the printer to drive it as fast as it can and win the race. But that doesn't happen without practice, practice, practice. So what we ensure, especially during the time when we set up the press, that an instructor is on site, even after the regular training, just to support the printer, answer maybe questions, show him tips and tricks to really run it at full speed. And that concept is proven and it's working very well. We can see just to one or two extra weeks of training support, the presses run way faster as without it. And then we have the remote or on-site consulting. We collect lots of data about our presses and consultants review that data. And if possible, they give the customer a call and also add basically on the artificial intelligence of what could be done better 
or they schedule a call on site that they say, well, there's something going on which I can't see what it is, but your figures are not at a stage where they should be. So we would like to come by, analyze, and then provide you basically a solution where we work together on the implementation. These are one of the key benefits through the program. And again, um, the, the picture I really like on that one, it's only working if it's teamwork because our consultants can suggest stuff on making processes better. The customer has to work on it as well. Otherwise that will fail. But again, we have all the same goal. And we basically check in our subscription model that the customer gets the right equipment and the right support for his needs. And all at a, at a cheaper cost, so to say, of what he has now. So that was a very fast run through the Heidelberg uh, subscription model and what we do at Heidelberg. I would hand back over to Rick then. Thank you very much, Oliver, for these interesting insights into the Heidelberg Druckmaschine. Thank you very much for now. Dear ladies and gentlemen, Agathon is currently working on an interesting innovation project with the University of St. Gallen. Therefore, we have invited the two doctoral students, Jonathan Rösler and Christoph Tienkent from the University of St. Gallen, who gained a lot of experience in this field and will also give us a guest lecture on this topic. Jonathan and Christoph, would you briefly like to introduce yourself? Yeah. yeah, thank you, Raquel. Um, my name is Jonathan and I'm a research associate at the Institute of Technology Management at the University of St. Gallen. Um, we are not a typical university, though, so we are working closely with customers in the industry and also equipment providers, especially on this exciting topic of subscription business model. And that's exactly what we want to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So I hand over to you with your guest lecture. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you very much. And Good afternoon once again from Switzerland to the audience joining us today here from all over the world. Um, I think I will probably talk in a similar way as um, Oliver Demos from Heidelberger Druckmaschine before. So I really, I'm really a fan um, of, of subscription business model that's that been said um, at the beginning. And often I'm asked, people come to the Institute saying, why is that? Why should we as a provider offer subscription? Why we as customers should um, do that, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about in the next 10 minutes. But let us quickly start with something in the beginning. So what is subscription? Where does it come from? And I think every one of you has already heard about this, this buzzword in the air. It's coming from software, right? Um, you are today, um, you, it's possible for you today to buy the, the word software in, in such a model. You don't pay for the license fee, but then you pay over time in a monthly or yearly fee. And this model also gained significant attention in the industry in the last, I would say, five years. And we have seen many manufacturers thinking about how they could bring this model to industry. And at the moment, we see three different areas of application being software as a service one. So this also this get the software and don't pay upfront, but only for what you really need. Secondly, it's about equipment as a service. So don't purchase the machine upfront, but pay back, so to say, with your production volume over time for instance, via paper use. And third and finally, um, when we talk about digital services, many customers are reluctant to, to purchase such services. And then subscription offers this really easy entry because you can really subscribe for a month or half a year and then decide whether this provides value to you. And I think that being said, Christoph, I will hand over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, and also good afternoon from my side. My name is Christoph Tinken. I'm also a research associate at the University of St. Gallen. And indeed, what Jonathan uh, said, digital services, digitalization and subscription are really one of the main trends in the manufacturing industry. In our daily project work, uh, we are experiencing six factors that are really uh, driving customers to go into such subscription models. Um, which we want to also highlight in uh, today's presentation. Uh, number one is really data and connectivity. Uh, we have seen that especially the successful practices from the software companies are pushing uh, customers in the manufacturing industry to really look into data that is coming from the PLC, that is really coming from the machines, and they are really asking them themselves how can they get the value out of it. So a very important topic. Then number two, of course, the operational support. Uh, 
we experience that quite a lot of customers are really requesting uh, services to increase the, the productivity, to really shift unplanned downtime to planned downtime. So quite an important topic also here. And then number three, I think a really uh, pressing need, especially during uh, the COVID times we have right now, um, once customers are facing tight financial uh, budgets, more and more customers are really striving to move away from capital and expenditures towards operational expenditures to preserve some liquidity, especially in their balance sheet. And then on the long term, we have, of course, the, the focus on the core business. That really means that we experience more and more customers are also planning to outsource certain activities, especially when it comes to maintenance and repair activities, but also the supply of consumables or process consulting services. So here customers can really focus on their core business and let the providers do, let me say, the activities where they are not that capable of doing it. Then number five, um, we are quite convinced that uh, digitalization and digital uh, services really allow for new ways of interacting with the customer along the entire customer journey. So it's not only about uh, developing a digital solution together with a customer to create value, it's especially also what uh, Mr. Demo said in his uh, presentation, that you have a customer success manager who is especially after the sales deal is done, responsible to continuously increase your performance. And that is uh, quite a big commitment that uh, manufacturers are giving you. And then number six, uh, it's also another important point. Uh, what we are experiencing in our daily work is that more and more customers are really looking into the entire life cycle cost of a machine, especially talking about the total cost of ownership. And they are more and more interested in really having a deeper look into the outcome or output uh, of uh, such a machine where you can link really the revenue model of a digital services more towards the outcome. However, um, once you have such a digital service, there are also barriers we want to mention here in our presentation today. Um, number one here is really that the purchasing process on the customer side is often yeah, very unsuitable for those long-term uh, contracts. Purchasing departments are very often still incentivized for one-time savings, and it's kind of hard to convince the customer really of a long-term uh, contract and the benefit that really lies within a few years that are coming up. Then, of course, promises often not kept in the past. We have also worked together with companies that were making promises with uh, certain digital services and those promises were not kept. So of course, customers are somehow reluctant really to go into such a digital uh, venture together with a service provider. And another important point uh, which we see almost every day is that there's still an unclear value add of such a digital service or subscription model um, because digital services are really hard to grasp sometimes, and then it's up to the provider to really show what the digital service is capable of. And the last part then is really the reluctance to go into long-term contracts. So still quite a lot of customers are not really willing to commit to a contract over a certain uh, period of three to five years. Um, but I think, Jonathan, what we have seen is that there are still quite some companies out, out there that were able to overcome these barriers, right? Definitely. I mean, in a nutshell, do subscription pay off? Right, of course it pays off, um, but maybe not in the short term. And you would say, okay, those researchers saying these things, but is it really true? So look on the right side. So we came up with this, this survey, what we recently conducted with one of our customers. So it's a global machine tool manufacturer. And we have asked customers, not only in Europe, but also in the US and China, how would you, you know, evaluate this, this go-to market of the new subscription offering? And I would say after six months, feedback was, was not so good, I would say. But then after 12 or 16 months, everybody was really happy that this thing was launched. So you can see 68% of the customers have said, well, I re I'm really positive about that this thing's happened. And why is that? Well, we think it's about six key things uh, you should have in mind when talking about those things. And I think the first thing is really at the end subscription brings and offers you more than before, and you basically can also pay less. Why is that? So simply saying, 
um, if you have a lot of customers going into such models, the quality of such a service is increasing over time because the OEM as the provider gets new knowledge and then can improve the service. So basically, um, this, this, this penetration of the market with a lot of customers then also allow the provider to reduce the prices slightly. So basically, compared to today where you offer let's say five services and you can opt for everyone uh, extra, you can just get the full package within one offering. Secondly, um, I think subscription, and, and that's basically the main idea about it, offers you the switch to operational expenditures, right? In terms of cash flow management, this is highly attractive to many customers out there in the world. So the CFO always wants to reduce the expenses and subscription offers you to basically pay over time and also pay over time depending on how the benefits um, actually unfold in your, in, uh, in, your, in your company. Third, I think it's about predictable expenses. So instead of paying, you know, break and fix when something is going wrong, such models offer the opportunity to really calculate in the long term, making you more competitive when you, for instance, um, um, apply for, for, for new um, um, contracts for your customers. So you can really plan with, with a price per unit, etc. Third, it's about competitiveness. So we have asked many customers out there and, and looked how they competed after they int uh, entered into subscription offerings. And the main message, and this is also what Oliver has uh, said before, um, customers really going into such offerings are becoming better than those who are not participating in such a model. So uh, we would like to really invite customers to consider subscription, not only because of the flexibility you can see in point five, but also because of the community. So um, this, this, this community thing is, is the last point that I would like to mention. So all the customers in such models then can exchange about best practices. They can you know, talk about the same topics and then this digital trainings at some point will help to further boost productivity. Because this at the end is really what subscription at the end provides. It's not just a buzzword out there. It's something that at the end helps you to become better. And that being said, I would like to thank you once again for listening to us and hand over to you, Rakhve. Yeah, thank you also very much to you both for sharing these valuable insights, Jonathan and Christoph. Now I would quickly once like to go back to Agaton once more and ask Christoph, which services does Agaton already offer in the subscription model? Thank you. Okay, we have summarized the services which we can offer you in a first step in a service configurator. You receive the link to it afterwards that you can have a look at the page at your disposal. So let me now explain the content of this page. Here on the top, you can switch the language from German to English or vice versa. Then here, you can jump off to our standard um, website or you can get easily in contact with us. Here, in the first section, you'll see the six mentioned services. There we have two services like Smart Connectivity Interface and Live Status, which you already know from our Internet of Things world. Then we have two new ones, AppliCare Remote and AppliCare Test from our application department. And the package will be closed with two services from our of the sales department, supply care and remote care. Remote service, for example, offers new response times from six in the morning to eight in the evening. Now, if you go ahead, you see the same services as mentioned before, but now with detailed description. If you click here on further information, you will lead to another page which contains all of the detailed information you need to this service. Let's go back. Here you can see some of the advantages of subscription um, from Agaton's point of view. Now, at the bottom, you can see our service configurator. Here you can easily combine the services you need. Let's make an example. If you take Smart Connectivity Interface and Remote Care, for example, then you have to choose how many machines you have in your machinery. Let's assume you have one. If you go ahead, you will see here on the left side your configuration 
and then on the right side the price you have to pay annually. If you want to get a quotation from our site, click this button and then please fill in this short form and we will send you a detailed quotation from our site. Let's make quickly another example. Now we have these two services here, but now you have more than one machine. Let's assume you have three now. If you go ahead, on the left side, you will see your configuration, but now you won't see a price. This is for reasons of protection um, from the benchmark for, for our competitors. The price is only shown for one machine. But don't worry, you can get in contact with us with the same form here and then, of course, you will receive a quotation as well. At the very bottom of this page, we have our feedback form. Um, we are happy to receive constructive feedback to our page here, to our service configurator or to our services as well. Thank you. With this, I give back to Rekel. Yeah, thank you very much, Christoph, for this introduction into the new service configurator of Agaton. Thomas, does Agaton plan to offer additional services in the subscription model in the future? Well, yes, for sure we do. So, as an example, we are actually thinking to implement software on demand. So that means for the customer that he has the possibility to get the software only when he's really required it for a project, for example, for a month, for example, and when this project is over, he has not to pay any more for it. So his big advantage will be he has to pay for the service when he uses it and not a one-way fee. Um, as well, we are thinking for uh, in the future, if we have an outlook in the future, we are thinking also for models as a full service model probably, or then at the end what we heard already two times from Oliver Demos and also from the colleagues from St. Gallen, that in the future we will have the possibility to offer an equipment as a service then, so that you have to pay for use and not on the machine itself. So that's what we are actually in consideration with some partners, um, what possibility we have there and what we can offer you in the future. Um, what will be important for us during this procedure that we will be in contact with you, with the customers, to have a feedback, to know what will be important for you, what are your needs, what are your pains, and where we can prepare some gain for you with the subscription model. Thank you very much, Thomas. Christoph, do you have any additional remarks to Thomas' comments? Maybe only one thing. Um, um, I can, in, can imagine that we will offer um, the possibility to join online trainings and webinars as well in um, subscription packages in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I would like to address our guests again at this point. Um, what do you think of the ideas of Agaton uh, presented by Agaton? Do you think they are realistic? Uh, Oliver, we heard from our two doctoral uh, students that such models often face resistance and skepticism on the customer side. Uh, Oliver, yeah. so is here with us. Okay. What experience? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here. I was just uh, very good. Needed. <laughs> no problem. Um, <laughs> Um, y yes, I think it's a realistic approach and uh, I mean, I see it with how we approached it. There's challenges in the beginning uh, for us. The biggest challenge was the cost. It was a different thinking of pricing regarding the whole model coming from I purchase everything I need separately and I pick who I believe is the best one. And now you are going into a relationship and you purchase everything from one source. There were concerns, but um, we also had feedback rounds with our customers after the first and, and second year of those contracts. And the feedback was very positive. And they said, well, where we struggled in the past, uh, if, if there was a problem, there was always the vendors pointed always to the others, but nobody was really responsible. So now we have one vendor who is responsible for everything and we have one person to go to. So, they took that as one of the big benefits. 
And the funny part is, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it before, the print shops really knew the model already from the digital devices like copies, copiers, etc., but just not from, from the conventional printing equipment. So there was a challenge in the beginning, but now I think we, we preached it enough how it works. Everybody is familiar with it and we see it that there's more and more interest coming, but we had a ramp up phase also. The first two years we were very busy traveling and explaining the model, not only to our customers, but also to our internal sales force as well. Thank you very much, Oliver. Now, uh, Jonathan and Christoph, what is your view on, on the ideas presented by Akaton? Yeah, I mean, I'm young. I, I, I might still have vision, but um, I really like the idea. Um, I'm deeply convinced about that. And I know people are skeptic about such models, but then I always tell them, well, look, two things to consider. On the one hand, put yourself in the role of the OEM, right, who's about to, to offer such a model. I mean, he has this force to bring every year a better service, because if you not provide this, you can simply leave, right? So mm -hmm. this is the benefit of subscription. And secondly, I'm always saying, well, um, take it as a journey, right? Because who would believe what is going to happen in three or five years? And you need to start now to, to be really competitive in the future. And as I said before, those customers we have seen who had this eager and, and in, so to say, interest to, to go in such models were then really the, the ones that could also sell to their customers. Hey, we are those innovative uh, people. We have the new digital technologies. We protect the, the quality. We, we increase efficiency for you. So I think in total, um, it's really a good idea. Mm -hmm. Christoph, do you have any remarks? Um, yeah, I mean, I can only confirm what uh, Jonathan said. I'm also quite convinced of Agaton's uh, approach, um, but also talking about maybe other industries that are maybe a little bit further ahead, such as building automation or aviation. Of course, customers are really reluctant in the beginning, but uh, from what we've heard, um, after customers really see the value uh, that has been demonstrated uh, over the time, um, they really appreciate such subscription models. And um, it's, it's really about having a little bit, uh, of course, patience, because one thing is for sure, a digital service does not pay off within like uh, three or four months. It takes time and unfolds also its value over a long time. So once you have that patient, I'm pretty sure you will get, uh, even as Agaton's customers, the value out of it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Christoph. And let's ask the other Christoph. Uh, is the implementation of such a subscri uh, subscription model at all realizable for expensive machines and in the area of cutting edge technology? How do you access this from Agaton's point of view? I think from our perspective, um, this can be combined well. Um, in our niche market, Agathon machines um, are certainly among top technology. And in combination with the flexibility or planability of costs, which the subscription model brings with, um, customers are getting more competitive then. And I think that's a big plus. Mm -hmm. And maybe one more question. What is the benefit to me as a customer if I subscribe to a service instead of buying it? Maybe Oliver, you can say something about that again. Now I forgot to unmute. Uh, yes, I can. Um, one benefit is uh, to, to both of us, basically, we have the same goal. So Heidelberg has, uh, of course, a goal that the customer prints as much as he can because we participate on that as well. And the customer has the same goal and we do everything in our power to support him. Secondly, there is now additional cost to the customer to get him to the next level. It's, it's all included into the price if we realize or the customer hires a new pressman, which needs extra training. There's no additional cost to the customer. We provide the training because we want to ensure that the pressman runs the press at its best and uh, gets the highest output. So I think that is the, um, the peace in mind, if you want to say so, for the customer, because he knows I purchased that press and I want to achieve that output and Heidelberg does everything that I can achieve it. Of course, he needs to work with us as well. But the good thing is there's no additional cost, basically, to it. And I think that's, that's the one thing. The other part is 
we are developing more and more features uh, and the subscription customers are the ones in the beginning which can try it they can give us feedback and they are the yeah they have the first usage of that so there's a few areas where they where it's really beneficial to the customer to be part of that project thank you very much oliver maybe jonathan and christoph want to add something as well or is it all said from my point i think Everything I said, it's, it's really a good idea. I wish I got on much success with this. Thank you very Thank much. You. Maybe one last question to Thomas. Some mm -hmm. of the services that Agaton now offers as a subscription um, might already have been purchased with the last mach machine. Mm -hmm. Can they still um, subscribe to services? Yes, as an example, uh, if they have the remote care already available with the machine, um, after the warranty per period has been over and is yeah has been already over, it's still possible that after the time of the warranty period that they can uh, sign or subscribe for a remote care again. So that means that they can go on with this service for for the next time as well. So that's absolutely possible, and yeah, there we're really requesting for your inputs and. Then we can also uh, prepare the right thing also for the future, for sure. That I would say nothing is impossible. <laughs> they Thank you very much, Thomas. And thank you very much to you all for these truly valuable insights into the topic of subscription and digitalization. Thank you very much, Christoph Stürchle and Thomas Hess from Agathon, Oliver Demus from Heidelberger Druckerei, Druckmaschinen, and Jonathan Rösler and Christoph Tienken from the Institute for Technology Manage Management of the University of St. Gallen. Thank you very much to you all for being with us today and for sharing your knowledge with us. Dear ladies and gentlemen, after all these valuable insights, we have now almost reached the end of our Agathon Technology Days 2021. But before we say goodbye to you, we are now, of course, very curious to know who won one of these virtual reality full kits from HTC Vive Pro worth 1,200 euros in our competition. We have evaluated all the answers and are now very happy to announce the lucky winner and the winner of a virtual reality full kit from HTC Vive Pro worth 1,200 euro is, I will check the other monitor, it is Michael Lurquin. Congratulations to you. Please enter your contact details in the chat or contact us via our social media channels so that we are able to send it to you. We already wish you a lot of fun and enjoyment with it. Ladies and gentlemen, this unfortunately brings us to the end of our Agathon Technology Days 2021 on the topic of machines. We hope we were able to inspire you with our exciting innovations, support you with lots of know-how and surprise you with fun and games. And of course, we are still at your disposal today and in the next few days. Should you have, should you have any questions or wishes, just write us in the chat or book an individual session with our consultants at any time today or in the next few days. To book such a session, simply scroll down the event page and select the desired consultant. Please do not hesitate to take advantage of this offer because we are already very much looking forward to a personal exchange with you. We hope you found the Agathon Technology Days as interesting and exciting as we did, and we are already very much looking forward to welcoming you at the latest in October at the IMO in Milan. Until then, we wish you a wonderful time and above all, good health. Thank you very much for your attention and see you very soon.